we're very, very happy to introduce our next guest, talking about using AI to tackle our planet's most urgent problems. Yes, we're starting big. And it is my pleasure to welcome the Chief Technology Officer of Amazon. It's Dr. Werner Vogels. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I love a bit of dramatic entrance. Yeah. And um, actually, thanks to the wonders of modern medicine, I'm able to stand here in front of you pain-free. I've been given an artificial knee. Yeah, there wasn't intelligence necessary, but it is absolutely great to be able to stand in front of you pain-free. Now, I opted to do this in a hospital in the Global South. And while that was amazing, and the quality of the hospital was amazing, for many people in the global south, this kind of healthcare is not available. Or if it is available, it is definitely not affordable to them. And why did I do that? Well, over the years, as uh, the CTO of Amazon, and not only of Amazon, but also of our cloud computing division, I've become inspired by businesses and organizations that have been using technology for good. Um, Am I supposed to have a clicker? Thank you. And, and actually, it's really, and especially young businesses that actually have tried to build a business while doing good at the same time. And I've been so inspired by these young businesses that five years ago, I started to make a video series about them called Now Go Build. Our planet and our civilizations are changing faster than ever before. Join me as I travel the globe talking to startup founders using technologies to make our world more interesting, accessible and livable. These are the entrepreneurs that are creating the future we will live in. This is Now Go Build. So, many of these younger businesses are tackling the world's hardest problems and mostly in an environment where they've been exposed to those problems themselves. And it's extremely inspiring. And what I'm trying to do in the coming 40 minutes in this talk to you is show how AI is already used for good. It is not something that is in the future. It is something that people have been working on for the past 20, 30 years. Remember that AI is not a new field. It's a 50-year-old field in computer science. Natural language processing, computer vision, all these areas have been around for a long time already. And many companies, organizations, and governments are using AI for good at this moment already. But you know, let me give you a number of examples here. Yep. This is Hara. This is a young business in Jakarta, who were the founders of the business actually come as sons from smallholder rice farmers. Many of the rice farmers, the smallholder rice farmers in Indonesia, have no identity. And no identity means you cannot get a loan from a bank. So to buy your seeds for the next year, you have to go to a loan shark in the village. He will charge you between 40 to 60% interest on the loans given. Just by giving these farmers an identity, it is already able to actually give them loans through regular channels. Important in all of this is that it's not just an identity. They're actually working together with people on the ground to actually measure the plot of land, to measure the yield that that plot of land gives. And with that data, they can actually provide governments and other organizations, NGOs, and indeed financial institutions insight in how effective these farmers are. Yeah, and basically what you have, you have agents on the ground that measure the plot of land and actually gather this data, gather the yield data, and allows them to actually become partners in a normal economic society. There's many different stakeholders in all of this coming together. Yes, yeah, the farmer data, it is also database companies, it's satellite data that all flows together in a data qualifier situation where this data is actually sanitized and then made available to many others. They're very 
they, at this moment, when I actually uh, filmed them about five years ago, they were only active in Indonesia. And they're now active in eight different countries, well over 400 uh, field agents, and 10,000 farmers have been helped. And what is the amazing thing of this is that if we give these microloans to these farmers, there is a 100% repayment rate. So banks are eager to give loans to these farmers. Also, because they have the data about what is actually what the farmer can avoid, uh, afford and what they need. So all these companies have something in problem. It's something, oh, let me do something else first. So, yeah, so hard human problems is what these companies have in common. Yeah? They're not writing spam filters, although that is a really hard problem. Yeah? They're solving the world's hardest problems. And these problems only are getting worse. Yeah, because you know, if you look over the coming uh, it was, uh, 25 years, we expect our population to grow by well over 25%. And that means an enormous stress on our infrastructure, ability to feed people. And, you know, if you look at many of the SDGs, they all are coming under stress because of the fact that we have this growing population in the coming 25 years. So how do we ensure food and water security for this growing population? How can we mitigate the impact of agriculture on ecosystems and climate? And by the way, how can our economies support 1.5 more million people? These companies are using technology for good. And I actually believe that this is an area that has many of the answers to address the biggest problems that we're seeing in this world. Part of this technology is, of course, AI for good. Now, you know, uh, after all, that's why you're all here in this room, and we're all believers that technology will indeed help improve these SDGs. Remember, 2030 is not that far away, and we really need to accelerate the things that we're doing to meet these SDGs. Yeah, and I believe that technology, and AI specifically, will be the major tool that helps us getting there. Now, of course, for the past months, there's been tremendous hype in and around something called large language models, the transformer architectures underneath there, and generative AI. And at AWS and at Amazon, we have been investing in this just like everybody else. Yeah, and we have great tools available for our customers. We've been focusing on a particular part of this, mainly to be able to do this in an environment that is secure and actually manages privacy. I'm not going to talk about that today, yeah, because I think it is early days for large language models and generative AI. And I really want to talk about the things that we can already do with the tools that we have now today. Yeah, so really, what I want to talk to you about is AI for now. We already know how to do many of these things. As I said, after all, artificial intelligence is a field that has been in existence for the past 50 years. And I'll give you a range of examples of things that work really, really well. And I actually love this quote from John McCarthy. Yeah? As soon as it works, we won't call it AI anymore. Yeah? AI is really something that we think about, you know, Skynet and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and things like that. That's what speaks to our imagination. But in reality, this is just computer science and the tools that come with it, and tools that we can already apply today. Uh, one particular area, of course, when you think about feeding people, you cannot get around rice. Yeah, it actually is the stable crop for well over 50% of the world. Um, I may have been a little bit uh, some of the positive about how long I can actually stand on this artificial meat. So I'll take a little pause here. But let's start looking at rice. Yeah, because it is so important throughout the world. And there's a, a, a fascinating organization that's just outside Manila. It's called the International Rice Research Institute. 
Yeah? They are really working hard to abolish poverty and hunger among populations that depend on rice-based agricultural food systems. Yeah, and the most important part of their work lies in that food security is depending on genomics. Yeah, the ability to create rice genomes and know exactly how to improve the growing of rice. They have the largest collection of rice genomes in the world. There's 200,000 strands of rice in a massive freezer in Manila with a backup system in the north of Norway. They can regrow any strand of rice that may have been eliminated because of natural disasters or because of climate change. Yeah, and a good example, for example, of this manipulation of rice or finding the right rice is what's called golden rice. This is rice with a very high vitamin A content and which can be used to, to combat deficiencies which is present in many people around the global south that depend on rice. And they have literally the largest collection in the world. Their biggest challenge, however, is getting rice into the rice, into the, the seed bank. Yeah, what they have to do, they get all of contingency from all over the world, these different strands of rice, they have to sort them, they have to find which type of rice uh, seeds is, is viable, which are not damaged, which have the best chance of success. And this used to be a human uh, task, because they have all these experts in looking at the rice. However, there's so much rice coming towards them that they create a massive backlog which is kept outside the freezer and as such often gets damaged because of the backlog. So they started building a machine learning powered seed sorting mechanism. Yeah, they sort rice for the genome banks and based in making use of computer vision yeah, and that was trained on human labeled uh, Im imagery, they're able to define what good seeds look like and actually sort them out. There's still humans involved, by the way. Yeah, this is not something that is completely automated. It is automated in terms of sorting, but there's still humans involved in making quality, decis quality assurance decisions. And this is something that goes for most of the automation for where we are using machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah, it is these machines, these machine learning machines, help us make predictions. They don't make decisions. We, as humans, are the ones that make decisions. These machines can just help us predict what is good and what is bad based on the past. Yeah, and so the gene bank also is actually part of a uh, large coll global collaborative. Yeah, the International Rice Research Institute has put a, a huge number of varieties, well over 3,000 rice genomes that they have sequenced in the Rice Genome Project. And that is available for all researchers around the world to use. And it's actually hosted on uh, the Amazon cloud. And in addition to these sort of practical solutions within their organization, they're looking holistically at sort of the broader impact of agricultural problems. And one of the biggest problems there is in rice farming is that farmers, especially smallholder farmers, have not been educated well on the use of fertilizer. And as such, they over-fertilize their crop, which means there's a massive runoff of nitrogen into the regular ecosystem, which creates algae and actually damages the rest of the, uh, the water ecosystem around these rice paddies. Just be able to help these farmers be precise about how much fertilizer they can use. And there's been many different techniques for them. For example, they have a voice-based system where farmers, of course, most of these farmers are illiterate. They can't read and write. They can't use a smartphone. But they can call into the system, describe the patch of land, and get advice back about how much fertilizer to use and when to apply it. Or they can make use of, and that's sort of what the IRI think is the future, of really precision-based agriculture using drones. And I'll talk a bit more about drones later, but drones cannot exist without AI. It's all driven by machine learning and artificial intelligence. And what they hope they can get to is to the point that they can actually get these, these views of these fields 
all the way up to the detail of the individual rice plants. The vision of RRI is that in the future, you will be able to fertilize individual plants that actually need them instead of just fertilizing everything at the same level. And without computer, si computer vision and machine learning, this kind of precision uh, agriculture is absolutely not possible. Yeah, and the idea of precision uh, architecture is at the forefront of the future of food production. AI can enable a really precise focus while farmers grow a scale of crop big enough to feed our growing population 25 years from now. Now, one, this is rice. Another particular food group that we're all very dependent on is protein. Yeah? And actually, 20% of the world of protein intake is dependent on fish for protein. Now, fish is actually um, it's very interesting because at this moment, the majority of the fish that we get is done through fishing in the seas and in the rivers. This is an extremely damaging industry. Greenpeace reports that fishing nets account for about 86% of the large plastic waste, which is called in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We sit in the Pacific Ocean and it has three times the size of France. Yeah? It's extremely damaging current fishing approaches to the environment. So fish farming is a much better controlled environment to grow fish. But there's another reason to actually doing this. Yeah? One kilo of fish food will result in one kilo of fish. However, if you do cattle farming, you need to actually have seven kilos of feed before you can get a kilo of protein out of that. Yeah? And so we need to shift the protein. And we know actually, by the way, especially here in Europe at the moment, how damaging cattle farming is, not just because of the amount of food that it needs, but the impact on the environment that it has. If we want to reduce that impact, we will need to move to consuming fish as our main source of protein. An interesting company that actually is trying to solve this problem is a company called Aquabyte. And this is in another now go build episode. Um, and so they are making use of, um, of AI and machine learning to actually support, to improve what's called aquaculture. And say so they have hundreds of fish pens around the world in Norway and Chile and in Scotland. And the mission is to improve fish farming techniques while supporting conservation and using sustainable use of marine resources. They identified the major challenges of fish farming, which is the quick spreading of diseases of these fish, which are actually kept in pretty close proximity. In one of these fishing pens that you just saw before, there's about 100,000 salmons in one of these pens. And as you can imagine, if lice, which is the biggest challenge in fish farming, actually appears in there, 100,000 salmon are pretty quickly infected. So they make use of computer vision and machine learning to actually quickly identify if any of these diseases happen. And so they built this very unique camera on which a number of machine learning models run already to identify the individual fish, to identify their growth, to identify potential diseases. And as such, being able to act really quickly if one of these things happen. But at the same time, they're creating an enormous data set about knowledge about growing fish in a fish farming environment. And beyond these, these cameras, they also make use of IoT sensors that collect data about uh, salinity, temperature, oxygen levels. All of these things are coming together in a massive data set that they're using. And so they've now analyzed well over one billion fish. And their machine learning models continuously are improving, so they can make very rapid decisions about how to treat fish for diseases or remove deformed or wounded fish from a healthy population. And they can do this, if do this based on a data-driven machine learning approach, which results in more food, 
less environmental impact, and while having a solid business model. Many of the things, many of the examples that I will give you will be about younger businesses that have started this business. And what they do actually is actually be interested in doing good while actually making money at the same time. So if you look at many of the, uh, if you go back to the SDGs, the future of health is of course also paramount. Nah, don't worry about that. Uh, but thank you. Um, I talked about earlier about healthcare. If you think about healthcare in the global south, you know, um, if I just visited Brazil, there's another now go build episode on that uh, of, uh, for example, a company called Dr. Consulta that is making, using data and a machine learning approach to drive the cost of healthcare down. You know, in Brazil, you know, they have an incredible heart problem. 200 million citizens, of well of 150 million are what's called medically homeless. How do you improve healthcare for everyone? How do you get vaccines to them in a timely manner? And especially if you think about rural healthcare, remember, rurals are not sort of on the outskirts, not just that they're on the outskirts, actually they're crucial, the rural world, for our citizens that live in cities. Yeah? And as I said earlier, even though they may have access to healthcare, it's not affordable to them. A company that is very interesting and that I met with recently in Australia is trying to solve one particular problem giving access to vaccines and medication to rural areas for which there is no infrastructure to get there. So what they're doing is they make use of drones. Uh, and if you think about drones, there is a whole range of things that are actually AI slash machine learning related. Uh, there's flight planning. There is no pilot behind these drones. You basically tell them where to go. And they need to figure it out by themselves. While they're doing that, they need to avoid other objects in the sky. Birds, other airplanes, other drones, things like that. And when they need to land, they need to avoid not landing on your head. Yeah? And as such, bringing these uh, into rural areas is a crucial way to get there. Yeah? And this drone technology really reduces the impact of highly infectious diseases. Yeah? In 2018, a one-month-old baby called Joy became the first child in the world to receive a vaccine delivered by drone. And it's not just that they're delivering vaccine, they're actually taking uh, uh, blood samples and test samples back to uh, central laboratories to be actually investigated. So whether it's agriculture or aquaculture or healthcare, there's all these examples of you know, companies that are working using technology for good. But what do they have in common from an AI standpoint? Computer vision. Now, I want to make one point. Yeah, I often have used already AI machine learning sort of interchangeably. Yeah, but it's not the case. AI is the broader computer science field that exists already for 50 years. Yeah. One part of that is natural language processing, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, translation, sentiment analysis, document analysis. There's computer vision, there's image recognition, there's forecasting, personalization. If you've been an Amazon.com customer, you've been exposed to AI for the past 50 years. You just didn't know it. You know, recommendations, similarities, personalization, all of that AI. You just thought it was just a web page. Yeah. And for all of that, if you think about the AI, the basis for AI is not the tools. We already have those. We've had them for quite a number of years, the tools to do this. What is crucial in all of this is the data, because data is the foundation for all AI. Now, all of these examples, yeah, whether you look at IRI, the data that they created about sort of the, uh, the, the seeds, and the growth patterns, Aquabyte, thousands of labeled images for computer vision, Swoop, you know, all this without managed flight for thousands and thousands and thousands of hours, you could not do autonomous flight. Now, data is growing tremendously over the past years. Yeah, I think in 2020 was already 64 zettabyte. I think every year it is doubling, if not more. And there's two types of data. If you think about the past, it was called structured data. We, we knew already on forehand what kind of questions we wanted to ask. As such, we knew what kind of data we needed to answer those questions. And that was it. 
However, with the, the lowering cost of, cloud, of, uh, of computer storage, mainly done through cloud computing, you now can keep all the data around if you want to at minimum cost. And as such, you start to store data, all data that you have. And much of this data is unstructured, meaning audio, video, uh, uh, imagery. Remember, video and audio are not, no longer things to be watched. It is just data streams to be analyzed, making use of machine learning there. Yeah, and we make use of this unstructured data in machine learning. Why? Because you could see unstructured data as a massive haystack in which there is a needle that you're looking for. You don't know what the needle looks like, by the way. But you know there is a needle in there that you are looking for. And my best approach to find a needle in a haystack is to use a magnet. Yeah? Machine learning is the magnet you use to find needles in your unstructured data, data set, haystack. And um, I've given all these really great examples. Positive, great. There's also, our world is not just great. Um, and this might be a bit more sobering example of, of insight into unstructured data. This is Foreign's Spotlight program. Foreign's mission is to give law enforcement tools to help stay ahead of child sex uh, trafficking and other abuse. They use AI and data analysis to de detect escort advertisement likely to represent at-risk ch children. And so they've automated this process. They have this data set each new day. Each new day in the US, 100,000 new adverts are being placed for escorts. And so they're making use of this data set combined with a data set of missing children and missing women around the world to actually find and match them to these advertisements that are being placed. And they use these AI tools not just to find them, but to also protect the workers that actually need to look at these extremely disturbing images. And so foreign, next to the Spotlight project, which is all about image recognition and analysis and, and, and actually notifying uh, uh, law enforcement, they also make use of data mining and pattern recognition and collaborative filtering and user profiling to work on tools for prevention. They make use of machine learning and AI to build these tools which content providers can use to really eliminate CSMA from their data sets and already you know, sort of identify particular interaction patterns that may lead to grooming. Uh, while this is all based, yeah, so uh, just using the Spotlight, uh, program, just the, the Spotlight project, they identified more than 18,000 victims, including 6,000 children that have been rescued from the hands of sex traffickers. Yeah. This is all based on the fact that there is this data set available that they can use. Yeah. And without data, AI is nothing. But often data is a, uh, is a privileged asset, yeah, which we keep within our organization or which we keep within sort of the, the, the paywalls of our, uh, of our current world. But if you think about sort of the global south where I think climate change, for example, manifests itself most, data has the ability to make immediate impact. But without access to this right data, these regions cannot address challenges like forest fires or water scarcity or floods and droughts. It also means they can't actually reap the benefits of financial and educational and political areas of data ownership. I, I visited, the, um, visited the Philippines for, a, uh, for an episode of Now Go Build. And, and this is an extremely biodiverse re region. You know, they are smack in the middle of what's called Typhoon Alley. Yeah. And at the same time, they have a whole set of active volcanoes that actually continues to have impact on the land. Yeah. And in case of major disasters, there is a challenge of organizations to reach the people that they need to reach. And why is that? It's because there are no maps available for about where these people live. 
When I visited that, I actually came to the understanding that most of the commercial maps available today are only of areas that are commercially interesting. If an area is not commercially interesting, it's most likely not mapped. And these people that you actually want to reach in case of these major disasters are the unmapped of this world. So the humanitarian uh, street map program actually set out to do right this on the ground with volunteers mapping out the streets in the, in the remote areas such that we can actually create maps to reach people in the case of disasters, whether it's typhoons or another um, earthquake or another uh, volcano is eruption. And it's an amazing humanitarian effort, which, for example, the Red Cross in the Philippines absolutely relies on to be able to reach people in need that actually really need it and that are currently still what we call the unmapped of this world. Another area that is a bit more advanced, not people on the ground, but more from the sky, is Earth observation. Now, and we've seen an explosive growth with the launch of all these satellites of Earth's Earth observation data. Uh, it is crucial for a planet-level understanding of you know, the impact that we're having on our environment. And there's also a huge increase of organizations that are actually participating in this vertical, uh, meaning a lot more access to data for everyone. As such, we've created the Open Earth um, Data Observatory. Yeah, not, not as, as actually ESA and NASA and others that have done this. Yeah? And there's the remote sensing from a whole range of different types of satellites free of cost for everyone to use. Yeah? And of course, this is becoming the foundation for the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah? We at, uh, at AWS and at Amazon play actually a little, little role in all of that, in hosting all of this data. The two big initiatives going on, one is the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, and the other one is the AWS Open Data Registry, where this data is available for all researchers in the world to collaborate on. And one particular example of where this is using this Open Earth Observatory is Digital Earth Africa. Yeah, it's a collaboration between the ASDI and the Earth, Earth Observatory yeah, to create tools and capabilities for all the researchers in the world to use. Yeah, it's, for example, used to aim uh, at, at environmental monit uh, monitoring and the mitigation uh, of, uh, of environmental concerns. And the platform, of course, uses machine learning at its core in many different ways. Now, on one hand, there's, there's of course, satellite data uh, analysis. There's a large volume of satellite data in the, uh, in the data set. And it allows for automatic uh, identification and monitoring of how land covers changes, deforestation, urban expansion. And it provides policymakers with the data-driven decision tools for, late, for, land management, for land management, conservation, sustainable development, all the areas that we think are really important, but also disaster monitoring and food security. With this real-time data on historical patterns and current data, these algorithms in AI can identify risks for natural disasters like floods and droughts, where we can proactively take action instead of doing things after the fact. Timely evacuation, resource allocation, disaster response planning, all of these can be done ahead of time because we now have a data-driven approach to insights there. And the same goes for what we talked about earlier, agriculture, productivity, and food security. Uh, really keeping an eye on sort of what are the yields of the farms out there, what are the kind of actions that we need to take. And it improves sort of the outlook on crop production and it helps governments participate in, in anticipating food volumes and shortages. And they also, they've, they've been doing this for quite a while and a number of governments in, in Africa are actually making use of this data. In, in Zanzibar, government officials in the state university are monitoring erosion and sea levels and 
human impact on the mangrove de degradation. And in Ghana, government agencies are identifying deforestation linked to illegal mining. And in South Africa and Kenya, the platform is being used to understand the impact of forest fires. And actually, we've seen enough reports that this is not just doing good. It actually results in socioeconomic benefits. And this is two billion, and I think actually that is a very low key predictor. I like to believe that many of these techniques that we have already been talking about, but also the new generative AI techniques, have the potential to not only do AI for good, but do AI for profit at the same time. This is really what I want you to walk away with, is that AI, we, to be able to do AI, we need to democratize access to data if we want to do good. Yeah? If we think about sort of where we are aiming for, we're not aiming for AI, we don't care that much about AI or whatever technology, it's all about insights that we want to create. AI is the tooling that you see. We have all the tools necessary. And actually, with the generative AI, a whole new tool set is becoming available. All of this is useless if we don't have access to the data and to the right data. And whether they're structured or unstructured, we need to bring our data together to begin applying ML and other tooling for the good. And so a really great example of this is the Allen Institute. Yeah, so they have access to enormous sets of data about brains. And sort of, but the biggest barrier to entry into this world is that this data is not synthesized in one particular place. And um, my click, oh. so this is a brain map. Uh, and so the Allen Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to accelerate the in the how brains actually work. And despite massive investments, we haven't actually solved brain disorders like Alzheimer's or Parkinson. Yeah? And the need for foundational ne neuroscience resource, just like sort of the periodic table or the human genome map, is essential in helping this. And so the Allen Institute has created what's called the Brain Knowledge Platform, which has two parts, a new map of the entire brain at a cellular res resolution, and using this brain map, they've created the largest open source database of brain cell data in the world, where researchers can collaborate on. And without this collaborative resource, this would not be possible. And the great thing is, now that we have this platform, what are we going to do with it? Yeah. It's all about discovery. It is all about once we have access to the data, we can start using the tools that we already have or that are in development to actually try to solve or make progress on a number of these diseases. Yeah? Without data, all our AI tools mean nothing. And so what this means is that we need to really democratize discovery. Yeah? And discovery can only help if you have this data available for everyone to use. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to bring up a quote of uh, my uh, old mentor, Jim Gray. And Jim Gray is the inventor of, of transactions. He was a major computer scientist. He won the Turing Award. And it's all, his vision was to bring all of this data online, which would drive scientific progress. Actually, there's a very sad story part of the Jim Gray story. And I wish when that happened, when that sad part happened, I had access to machine learning and AI at the level we have now. Jim Gray was lost at sea at one moment when he went out with his boat out of the, uh, underneath the San Francisco Bridge, and he was never to be found again. We had had such an impact on us computer scientists that people from Google, from Amazon, Microsoft, and many other organizations of the world immediately came together, got all of the satellite data of the area around the San Francisco Bay, and we actually cut that up in 12,000 different pieces or many more, and making use of our artificial, artificial intelligence called Mechanical Turk, we had humans around the world looking at each of those images to see whether we could find this boat. If we would have access to the tools that we have now, 
for machine learning that would have been tasks I could have completed in half an hour. Yet it took days, and we never found Jim Gray. So what you have to ask yourself, what data do you have access to? Now, not only what do you have access to, what data do you need access to? To be able to do the good that you want to do. And so we do not need to have a major unification approach to data. Uh, for example, the UN data, data.un.org, already makes available many of the UN data to anybody that wants to use it. But I, I want to give you an example of at the beginning of the uh, Obama administration, um, the chief data scientist, uh, DJ Patil, made this effort to make all the government data available for everyone to use. It went nowhere. Why not? Because it started off with requiring everyone to actually publish this in a standard format. When they removed that requirement, say, just put your data out there, yeah, it actually accelerated and started everybody to use, start using this particular data. It is really a matter of actually really, you know, no longer being worried about sort of what format, just put it out there and people will come. It would be really nice if my clicker would work. Now, good AI, and AI for good, needs good data. And it works both ways. You know, good data really needs good AI to be able to get insights from that data, because data by itself means absolutely nothing. And as always, good work needs good people. After all, AI doesn't plant trees. We, as humans, plant trees. AI is just a tool that we're using to help us predict where we need to plant the trees. But we still need to do the work. So with all of that, thank you for your attention. And now go build. <laughs>